The following program deals with controversial subjects. The theories expressed are not the only possible interpretation. The viewer is invited to make a judgment based on all available information. Tonight on Sightings, has science discovered the secret of cryonics? And would you be willing to be frozen to death to extend your life? If it really can be done, I'm looking at immortality. And speaking of immortality, does the dead victim of an electrocution still haunt this house? And something got a hold of my hair and lifted me up. Our cameras captured evidence that even we can't explain. Light the kitchen's going on and off. And an entire town that believes they've shared past lives together. My name is Millie Sproul. Now, and during the Civil War, it was honey. At that point, it started to appear. They had large, dark eyes, claw-like hands. I began sensing and knowing and feeling. I do believe in life after death. I mean, I've been there. We have not scratched the surface of what the mind can do. It's a connection with the unknown. Is it possible to cheat death? Can we be brought back to life months, even years after dying? Well, there are scientists who are betting on the fact that one day, death won't be permanent. And some people are taking the biggest gamble of their lives. They're being frozen and mummified in a quest for immortality. In January 1985, a severe blizzard hit Milwaukee, Wisconsin. At the height of the storm, two-year-old Michael Track wandered outside his home. Within minutes, he was frozen solid. But miraculously, he was brought back to life. He was, uh, without any question, dead um, at the scene. And he was dead for a period of time here as well. Uh, but knowing that, because of how cold he was, knowing that you're not dead until you're warm and dead, um, we knew that we uh, had to give him the, the chance that he deserved. Michael's complete recovery astonished his doctors, and he is now living proof that a frozen human was indeed brought back to life. It's an exciting possibility for science. The resuscitation of a frozen person has inspired some scientists to try to take the process one step further. Cryonics is the extremely controversial science of freezing a person's body, or just the head, immediately after medical death. The hope is that someday they can be unfrozen and brought back to life. Cryonics is an experimental process. And it's experimental because we don't know what the ultimate outcome is going to be. We have a different opinion about where you draw the line between life and death. I don't think you can get dead people back from back to life. That's impossible. They're dead. How could you? I don't think that these people necessarily are dead. Once a cryonics patient is declared legally dead, the body is connected to life support systems. Cryoprotective drugs are administered to minimize damage from the freezing process. It takes three to five days to gradually freeze a body. And what you're seeing is the inside of a cryogenic doer and those are aluminum pods down there which contain our patients. The patient is inside the pod wrapped in a sleeping bag. Right now there's only two ways of, of putting people into cryonic suspension. Uh, either their whole bodies can be suspended like these people down here. Uh, some people choose only to have their brains put into cryonic suspension. Uh, right now uh, our methods of suspension are so crude None of these people will be recovered unless we can fix them one cell at a time. If you can do that, then it's a very small little bit extra to ask that you take any one of the millions of cells uh, that has the entire DNA, which is a blueprint for your entire body, and just grow a new one around the existing brain. Is cryonic science or science fiction? To date, three companies worldwide have frozen 40 people from all walks of life, and 600 more have signed up. But the medical community is universal in its condemnation of the process. I think it's misleading to people. Um, I think that it's giving some false hopes, uh, again, at least at this point. It's a rational gamble, because what they're doing is committing a relatively small amount of resources to the problem, and 
It's a personal issue. How much is your life worth gambling on? I mean, if this pays off and you end up with an indefinite lifespan in a you know, world filled with all kinds of possibilities we can hardly imagine now, what's it worth to you? Bring me back, I don't care how. Bring me back into the future. I want to be there. I want to witness this. I want to, I want to be able to get out of this freezing suspension or whatever they put me into to get me back. I want to be able to stand there and say, Bill, you made it. You're, you're really here in the future. The, the most important thing is that if they can do that, if it really can be done, I'm looking at immortality. You don't ever have to die. Um, you're not dead when you come out of the tank. You're not coming back from the dead. Um, you're simply been put in suspension, waiting for science to catch up with us. Is basically all we're doing. I don't want to go out with a bang. I don't want to go out with a whimper. I want to go out with a strategy. In case of death, see reverse for biostasis protocol. Push 50,000 U heparin IV and do CPR while cooling with ice to 10 Celsius. Keep Those who wish to be frozen upon death wear special identification tags, which give explicit instructions about how to freeze the body and who to contact. Well, let's say it doesn't work, okay? So you lose some money, you lose your life, you're frozen, that's that. But if it does work, well, then you get to live and everybody rots in the ground except you. Clearly, there's no guarantees. Uh, it's, only, it's your only shot. Is immortality really within our grasp? While cryonicists seek answers through futuristic high technology, others trying to cheat death are looking to the past, to an ancient Egyptian process called mummification. In permanent body preservation or mummification, the cells are perfectly preserved, possibly, Science may sometime in the future be able to duplicate that genetic message, um, reduplicate a body. Mummification is the only process that is a permanent process of preservation. The mummification process, the first step is basically to remove the organs from the body which has been embalmed. Then everything is placed in the vat with the body and it is soaked. This is the preservative, the active preservative. All the organs are coated with polyurethane. The cavity has been coated with polyurethane. Everything is returned to the body, and then the body is closed. A lot of people really feel basically that they w don't want the body to go through what is referred to as the corruption, the decomposition of the body. They want the body to stay intact. Mummification and cryonics raise profound questions about what might happen to these bodies in the future. Will we ever reach a point where these preserved bodies can live again? Or is reanimating a corpse just another horror movie plot? Some scientists believe it is the new reality of future generations. Coming up, does the dead victim of an electrocution still haunt this house? Our cameras captured evidence that even we can't explain. The light in the kitchen's going on and off. Ghosts. Many parapsychologists believe that they're collections of electrical energy. And conventional scientists agree electromagnetism is all around us. But paranormal researchers take it one extraordinary step further. They believe electromagnetism has a personality. That it can be the outward manifestation of a tortured soul in limbo. On July 28, 1974, Larry Richard Roach, an unemployed electrician, ended his own life with one rifle blast to the chest. Before his suicide, Larry Roach had been severely injured on the job. Electric shock had left him physically and mentally disabled. He had seizures, was emotionally unstable, and when his wife left him, Larry Roach became despondent and took his own life. Today, near Dallas, Texas, in this quiet neighborhood, a new family lives in the house where Larry Roach committed suicide. It was supposed to be the Lamonis family's dream house. They finally had a backyard for the children and plenty of room. But their happiness has been short-lived. They believe something is trying to force them out. Three weeks after we moved in, strange things started to happen. I had walked from the dining room into the kitchen, and about then, something got a hold of my hair and lifted me up, 
and I started hollering, Pam, Pam, help me. And she turned around and looked, and she said I was just like a, a, a haze all over me, like a glow, like I had lit up. Most of the disturbances in the house seem to be related to strange electrical energy that had an almost human form. It affected appliances, the telephone, the lights. The phone answering machine played back messages spontaneously. Then a frightening apparition appeared in the kitchen. All at once I just felt like something was in the kitchen. I just felt like something was staring at me. And I turned around and I looked and I seen laying on the floor like a whole figure of a man's body. I was terrified. So I got up and when I did it just vanished away like it went up into the air and smoke up into the kitchen light. And the terror only worsened. It started getting worse and worse in the house. It got to where I was scared to stay here. Late at night, eerie footsteps would echo throughout the house. The apparition paced outside the bedroom doors. Then the activity in the house took a sinister turn. Did the apparition want the family dead? I came home one afternoon, and the gas stove had been turned on, and Joe was asleep on the sofa. I came in, smelled the gas at the front door, left the front door open because you could not even walk in and it really scared me. After this incident, Pam started to ask neighbors about the history of the house. I told Pam something has happened in this kitchen. And she said, well, Mother, I think you're right. So she went to investigate with her neighbors, and they did explain to her that a man had committed suicide in the kitchen. The Lamonises wondered if it was Larry Roach's angry, restless spirit that was tormenting their lives. Desperate to find out, Pam contacted psychics Dwana Paul and Carol Williams. When Pam called me, she was very disturbed. Her voice was shaking. She said, I have someone in my house, and it's, it's, it's a ghost. I did feel cold spots in a few of the rooms. And as we were just sitting there in, in the living room, living area, uh, I started feeling the tingling sensation that I feel when a spirit is there. Just before the 18th anniversary of the suicide, the psychics hold a seance they hope will drive Larry Roach's spirit from the house. Carol, Duana, and other psychics join together with the Lamonis family. We've come here tonight to bring in the spirit of Larry from this house. And we're going to attempt to send Larry to the light understand that you that you committed suicide you killed yourself I sh sh pull that trigger a rush of energy fills the room pam feels something touching her he wants to touch my ear larry we we know you're here there's no reason for you to be in this house any longer. It's time for you to move into the other dimensions of light. You can no longer stay here. Move toward the light. It was a good seance. I could feel it. I could feel it when the chairs were shaking and everything. I knew it was here. But it didn't, did not leave. And I don't think it's going to ever leave this house because it kept saying over and over in my mind, this is my home, this is my home. To see if a spirit could be inhabiting the home, a sightings camera operator stays at the house alone. Okay, there's an awful lot of static electricity in the air right now. It seems to be coming from that tool shed. We found out later the tool shed was the last place Larry Roach was seen alive. The dog's barking at something, there's, there's nothing there. 3.30. I just felt something in the air around this area here, in this hall. Uh, the flashlight's going out. I don't understand because I, I just put batteries in it. The light in the kitchen's going on and off, but I'm not touching it. It's uh, 5 a.m. right now. There's, there's a weird smell. I, I don't know what it is. There's a lot of electricity in the air, more now than before. The warning light on the camera's on. Why are the batteries dying? 
Larry Roach seems to have made his presence felt, even to our crew member, and the Lamonises still fear the unearthly phenomena in their home. In the coming weeks, we'll return to Dallas for an update. Coming up next, an entire town that claims to have shared past lives together. My name is Millie Sproul. Now, and during the Civil War, it was honey. Our investigation uncovers startling evidence of reincarnation. When Sigmund Freud first introduced his theories about the importance of hypnosis, he was laughed at and ridiculed by his colleagues. Since then, hypnotherapy has gradually gained widespread acceptance. But now, a controversial new type of hypnotherapy is once again asking us to look at our lives in an astounding new way. It's the serious study of past life therapy. Even traditional doctors are starting to wonder if hypnotized patients can really recall that they have lived before in a different body. I got involved at first with past life therapy as a seemingly spontaneous or accidental thing. I was chairman of psychiatry, very much academically trained and left-brained. Dr. Brian Weiss is a respected psychiatrist and author of two books on past life therapy. No medical organization has come out really and endorsed this. Oftentimes they'll come up to me and say, I've had this marvelous experience or my patient has, but don't tell anyone. I get that a lot. One startling new case has doctors and hypnotherapists re-examining their beliefs. It all started in the small town of Lake Elsinore, California. Here, under hypnosis, more than 30 people all recalled that they had lived and died together more than 100 years ago. Under the guidance of Marge Reeder, a hypnotherapist for 16 years, Maureen Williamson was the first to speak of this shared past life. There was something, an incident that happened to me when I was real young, and I was interested in the details. It, it started initially with a name, and the name I had come up with was John Ashford. She said, oh, he's my husband. Well, that was not her husband's name. And I said, well, where are we? Well, we're in Melboro. In Marge Reader's practice, it's not unusual for someone to recall a past life, but what happened next startled the hypnosis community. So then she looked at me and she said, I saw Joe back there. And I said, Joe who? She says, Joe Nazarowski. He owned a, a security office down here on Main Street. Joe Nazarowski came to see Marge Reader and without prompting, told stories that were strikingly similar. During a Civil War time, I went to Milbro and my primary function there was that in the event that the war were to go badly for the Confederacy, to blow up the tunnel so that they could not use those materials against our military. Marge probed deeper with Maureen, and she recalled that even more people from Lake Elsinore could have had a history in Millboro, Virginia. And then she said, I saw Millie back there. Barbara Roberts was sitting in the room, and Barbara wrote me a note and said, ask her if I'm there. And I said, is Barbara Roberts back there in Virginia? She says, yes, she's John's, she's my mother-in-law. She's John's mother. And from there on out, it just snowballed. Maureen, who was the first to speak of Millboro, brought her husband in to see Marge. Under hypnosis, he recalled that he had been Maureen's lover in Millboro. Marge and I have found out, under regressions, is that uh, uh, I am still in love with the lady, and I always have been for 130 years. The Civil War, for example, is a very popular period. A lot of people have been there. I have people finding their own grave sites. They find their names. They know their way around, and they've never been in that area before. So this is extremely possible, probable. And I applaud this research. This is the type of thing that more people should have the courage to do. Marge Reeder has documented the first case of mass regression in her book, Mission to Millboro. As amazing as these stories are, skeptics argue that Marge was somehow influencing her patients unconsciously. So we decided to go on our own mission to Millboro for evidence of this shared past life. Our first step was to search for a boarding house, which almost everyone had spoken of under regression. And we found it. My boarding house uh, didn't have that much to do with the Civil War because I had the, the regular boarders and I fed a lot of people and I baked a lot of bread. Under regression, nearly everyone recalled a graveyard where Maureen, as Becky Ashford, was buried. Just outside of town, we found a family plot. 
I had been told by several people, Becky's grave is about a mile and a half outside of town. The graves are untended, the grass is high. Joe told me all along, it's in an enclosure. There's a little iron gate fence, and that's just what we found. Joe Nazarowski recalled that his name in 1861 was Charlie Patterson, a West Point graduate. A trip to the West Point archives uncovered this photograph taken in 1861. The cadet here is Charlie Patterson of Millboro, Virginia. Joe also recalled a tunnel that he was supposed to blow up during the Civil War. We found the tunnel and even these holes where he could have placed dynamite charges. That's where we're going to place the dynamite to make sure that if the Yankees came through, that it would take the tunnel out. They couldn't get the supplies. Before their regression, none of the people in Lake Elsinore had been to Millboro, but it's possible that they could have seen pictures or heard stories about the area. However, one place we discovered was unknown to even lifetime residents of Millboro, totally unknown to everyone but one of Marge's clients. It was a secret room used to hide slaves. The room was supposedly hidden underground near a church. Marge pinpointed its location using old maps and began to dig. We're in the middle of downtown Millboro. We have reason to think that there's an underground railroad hidden tunnel and room down here. And I heard about it just a few months ago from one of the newer girls in my Millboro study. After hours of digging, Marge broke through and found the secret room. You can see the room very clearly. You can see the green walls, green concrete walls as they were described to me. The plank ceiling, sod floor, and Civil War era paraphernalia provided further evidence that this room may have been the secret room revealed under regression. This discovery is an important step forward in the search for proof that the mass regression is more than just the power of suggestion or coincidence. In my practice as a psychiatrist, Doing past life regression work, I focus primarily on therapy, on healing. The other level, which Marge is doing, is extremely important also. It's proof that this is real. Thanks for joining us. For Sightings, I'm Tim White. Good night. Tomorrow, after an all-new COPS, when his landing gear fails, witness a pilot's desperate struggle to belly land his crippled plane on an all-new Code 3 after COPS tomorrow. And don't forget, this Sunday, it's the In Living Color blooper special, followed by an all-new Rock Live. Now, stay tuned for an all-new Rachel Gunn.